The Master of Mystery By Jack London There was complaint in the village. The women chattered together with shrill, high-pitched voices. The men were glum and doubtful of aspect, and the very dogs wandered dubiously about, alarmed in vague ways by the unrest of the camp, and ready to take to the woods on the first outbreak of trouble. The air was filled with suspicion. No man was sure of his neighbor, and each was conscious that he stood in like unsureness with his fellows. Even the children were oppressed and solemn, and little Diya, the cause of it all, had been soundly thrashed, first by Hunia, his mother, and then by his father, Baun, and was now whimpering and looking pessimistically out upon the world from the shelter of the big overturned canoe on the beach. And to make the matter worse, Skundu, the shaman, was in disgrace, and his known magic could not be called upon to seek out the evildoer. Forsooth, a month gone, he had promised a fair south wind so that the tribe might journey to the potlatch at Tonkin, where Taku Jim was giving away the savings of twenty years, and when the day came, lo, a grievous north wind blew, and of the first three canoes to venture forth, one was swamped in the big seas, and two were pounded to pieces on the rocks, and a child was drowned. He had pulled the string of the wrong bag, he explained a mistake. But the people refused to listen, the offerings of meat and fish and fur ceased to come to his door, and he sulked within so they thought, fasting in bitter penance, in reality, eating generously from his well-stored cash and meditating upon the fickleness of the mob. The blankets of Hunia were missing. They were good blankets, of most marvelous thickness and warmth, and her pride in them was greatened in that they had been come by so cheaply. Taekwon, of the next village but one, was a fool to have so easily parted with them. But then, she did not know they were the blankets of the murdered Englishman, because of whose takeoff the United States cutter nosed along the coast for a time, while its launches puffed and snorted among the secret inlets. And not knowing that Taekwon had disposed of them in haste so that his own people might not have to render account to the government, Hunia's pride was unshaken. And because the women envied her, her pride was without end and boundless, till it filled the village and spilled over along the Alaskan shore from Dutch Harbor to St. Mary's. Her totem had become justly celebrated, and her name known on the lips of men wherever men fished and feasted, what of the blankets and their marvelous thickness and warmth. It was a most mysterious happening, the manner of their going. I but stretched them up in the sun by the side wall of the house, Huniat disclaimed for the thousandth time to her Thlingit sisters. I but stretched them up and turned my back, for Diya, doe thief and eater of raw flour that he is, with head into the big iron pot, overturned and stuck there, his legs waving like the branches of a forest tree in the wind. And I did but drag him out and twice knock his head against the door for riper understanding, and behold, the blankets were not. The blankets were not, the women repeated in awed whispers. A great loss, one added. A second, never were there such blankets. And a third, we be sorry, Hunia, for thy loss. Yet each woman of them was glad in her heart that the odious, dissension-breeding blankets were gone. I but stretched them up in the sun, Hunia began for the thousand and first time. Yeah, yeah, Bound spoke up, wearied. But there were no gossips in the village from other places. Wherefore it be plain that some of our own tribespeople have laid unlawful hand upon the blankets. How can that be, O oh Bound, the women chorused indignantly. Who should there be? Then has there been witchcraft, Bound continued stolidly enough, though he stole a sly glance at their faces. Witchcraft. And at the dread word their voices hushed and each looked fearfully at each. I, Hunia affirmed, the latent malignancy of her nature flashing into a moment's exultation. And word has been sent to clock no ton, and strong paddles. Truly shall he be here with the afternoon tide. The little groups broke up, and fear descended upon the village. Of all misfortune, witchcraft was the most appalling. With the intangible and unseen things only the shamans could cope, and neither man, woman, nor child could know, until the moment of ordeal, whether devils possessed their souls or not. And of all shamans, 
Clock No Tun, who dwelt in the next village, was the most terrible. None found more evil spirits than he, none visited his victims with more frightful tortures. Even had he found, once, a devil residing within the body of a three months babe, a most obstinate devil which could only be driven out when the babe had lain for a week on thorns and briars. The body was thrown into the sea after that, but the waves tossed it back again and again as a curse upon the village, nor did it finally go away till two strong men were staked out at low tide and drowned. And Hunia had sent for this clock no ton. Better had it been if Skundu, their own shaman, were undisgraced. For he had ever a gentler way, and he had been known to drive forth two devils from a man who afterward begot seven healthy children. But clock no ton. They shuddered with dire foreboding at thought of him, and each one felt himself the center of accusing eyes, and looked accusingly upon his fellows each one and all, save Syme, and Syme was a scoffer whose evil end was destined with a certitude his successes could not shake. Ho! Ho! he laughed. Devils and clock no ton, than whom no greater devil can be found in Flinket land. Thou fool! Even now he cometh with witcheries and sorceries, so beware thy tongue, lest evil befall thee and thy days be short in the land. So spoke Lala, otherwise the cheater, and Syme laughed scornfully. I am Syme, and used to fear, unafraid of the dark. I am a strong man, as my father before me, and my head is clear. Nor you nor I have seen with our eyes the unseen evil things. But Skundu hath, Lala made answer. And likewise clock no ton. This we know. How dost thou know, son of a fool? Sign thundered, the choleric blood darkening his thick bull neck. By the word of their mouths even so. Syme snorted. A shaman is only a man. May not his words be crooked, even as thine and mine. Bah! Bah! And once more, Bah! And this for thy shamans and thy shamans' devils. And this! And this! And snapping his fingers to right and left, Syme strode through the onlookers, who made overzealous and fearsome way for him. A good fisher and strong hunter, but an evil man, said one. Yet does he flourish, speculated another. Wherefore be thou evil and flourish, Syme retorted over his shoulder. And were all evil, there would be no need for shamans. Bah! You children afraid of the dark. And when Clock Noton arrived on the afternoon tide, Syme's defiant laugh was unabated nor did he forbear to make a joke when the shaman tripped on the sand in the landing. Clock no ton looked at him sourly, and without greeting stalked straight through their midst to the house of Skundu. Of the meeting with Skundu none of the tribe's people might know, for they clustered reverently in the distance and spoke in whispers while the masters of mystery were together. Greeting, O Skundu! Clock no ton rumbled, wavering perceptibly from doubt of his reception. He was a giant in stature, and towered massively above little Skundu, whose thin voice floated upward like the faint far rasping of a cricket. Greeting, Clock No Tun, he returned. The day is fair with thy coming. Yet it would seem. Clock No Tun hesitated. Yeah, yeah, the little shaman put in impatiently, that I have fallen on ill days, else would I not stand in gratitude to you in that you do my work. It grieves me, friend Skundu. Nay, I am made glad, Clock No Tun. But will I give thee half of that which be given me? Not so, good Clock No Tun, murmured Skundu, with a deprecatory wave of the hand. It is I who am thy slave, and my days shall be filled with desire to befriend thee. As I. As thou now befriendest me. That being so, it is then a bad business, these blankets of the woman Hunia. The big shaman blundered tentatively in his quest, and Skundu smiled a wan, grey smile, for he was used to reading men, and all men seemed very small to him. Ever hast thou dealt in strong medicine, he said. 
doubtless the evil doer will be briefly known to thee. I, briefly known when I set eyes upon him. Again Clocknotun hesitated. Have there been gossips from other places, he asked. Skunda shook his head. Behold! Is this not a most excellent muckluck? He held up the foot covering of sealskin and walrus hide, and his visitor examined it with secret interest. It did come to me by a close driven bargain. Clock No Tun nodded attentively. I got it from the man Lala. He is a remarkable man, and often have I thought. So. Clock No Tun ventured impatiently. Often have I thought, Skundu concluded, his voice falling as he came to a full pause. It is a fair day, and thy medicine be strong, Clock No Tun. Clock No Tun's face brightened. Thou art a great man, Skundu, a shaman of shamans. I go now. I shall remember thee always. And the man Lala, as you say, is a remarkable man. Skundu smiled yet more wan and grey, closed the door on the heels of his departing visitor, and barred and double-barred it. Sine was mending his canoe when Clock No Tun came down the beach, and he broke off from his work only long enough to ostentatiously load his rifle and place it near him. The shaman noted the action and called out, Let all the people come together on this spot. It is the word of Clock No Tun, devil seeker and driver of devils. He had been minded to assemble them at Hunia's house, but it was necessary that all should be present, and he was doubtful of Syme's obedience and did not wish trouble. Syme was a good man to let alone, his judgment ran, and withal, a bad one for the health of any shaman. Let the woman Hunia be brought, Clock No Tun commanded, glaring ferociously about the circle and sending chills up and down the spines of those he looked upon. Hunia waddled forward, head bent and gaze averted. Where be thy blankets? I but stretched them up in the sun, and behold, they were not, she whined. So. It was because of Diya. So. Him have I beaten sore, and he shall yet be beaten, for that he brought trouble upon us who be poor people. The blankets. Clock Notun bellowed hoarsely, foreseeing her desire to lower the price to be paid. The blankets, woman. Thy wealth is known. I but stretched them up in the sun, she sniffled, and we be poor people and have nothing. He stiffened suddenly, with a hideous distortion of the face, and Hunia shrank back. But so swiftly did he spring forward, with interned eyeballs and loosened jaw, that she stumbled and fell down groveling at his feet. He waved his arms about, wildly flagellating the air, his body writhing and twisting in torment. An epilepsy seemed to come upon him. A white froth flecked his lips, and his body was convulsed with shiverings and tremblings. The women broke into a wailing chant, swaying backward and forward in abandonment, while one by one the men succumbed to the excitement till only Syme remained. He, perched upon his canoe, looked on in mockery, yet the ancestors whose seed he bore pressed heavily upon him, and he swore his strongest oaths that his courage might be cheered. Clock Notun was horrible to behold. He had cast off his blanket and torn his clothes from him, so that he was quite naked, save for a girdle of eagle claws about his thighs. Shrieking and yelling, his long black hair flying like a blot of night, he leaped frantically about the circle. A certain rude rhythm characterized his frenzy, and when all were under its sway, swinging their bodies in accord with his and venting their cries in unison, he sat bolt upright, with arm outstretched and long, talon-like finger extended. A low moaning, as of the dead, greeted this, and the people cowered with shaking knees as the dread finger passed them slowly by. For death went with it, and life remained with those who watched it go, and being rejected, they watched with eager intentness. Finally, with a tremendous cry, the fateful finger rested upon Lala. He shook like an aspen, seeing himself already dead, his household goods divided, and his widow married to his brother. He strove to speak, to deny, 
but his tongue clove to his mouth and his throat was sanded with an intolerable thirst. Clock Notun seemed to half swoon away, now that his work was done, but he waited, with closed eyes, listening for the great blood cry to go up the great blood cry, familiar to his ear from a thousand conjurations, when the tribe's people flung themselves like wolves upon the trembling victim. But only was there silence, then a low tittering, from nowhere in particular, which spread and spread until a vast laughter welled up to the sky. Wherefore, he cried. Nah! Nah, the people laughed. Thy medicine be ill, O clock no ton. It be known to all, Lala stuttered. For eight weary months have I been gone afar with the Siwash sealers, and but this day am I come back to find the blankets of Hunia gone ere I came. It be true, they cried with one accord. The blankets of Hunia were gone ere he came. And thou shalt be paid nothing for thy medicine which is of no avail, announced Hunia, on her feet once more and smarting from a sense of ridiculousness. But Clock No Tun saw only the face of Skundu and its wan, grey smile, heard only the faint far crickets rasping. I got it from the man Lala, and often have I thought, and, it is a fair day and thy medicine be strong. He brushed by Hunia, and the circle instinctively gave way for him to pass. Syme flung a jeer from the top of the canoe, the women snickered in his face, cries of derision rose in his wake, but he took no notice, pressing onward to the house of Skundu. He hammered on the door, beat it with his fists, and howled vile imprecations. Yet there was no response, save that in the low Skundu's voice rose eerily in incantation. Clock no ton raged about like a madman, but when he attempted to break in the door with a huge stone, murmurs arose from the men and women. And he, Clock no ton, knew that he stood shorn of his strength and authority before an alien people. He saw a man stoop for a stone, and a second, and a bodily fear ran through him. Harm not Skundu, who is a master, the woman cried out. Better you return to your own village, a man advised menacingly. Clock no ton turned on his heel and went down among them to the beach, a bitter rage at his heart, and in his head a just apprehension for his defenseless back. But no stones were cast. The children swarmed mockingly about his feet, and the air was wild with laughter and derision, but that was all. Yet he did not breathe freely until the canoe was well out upon the water, when he rose up and laid a futile curse upon the village and its people, not forgetting to particularly specify Skundu who had made a mock of him. Ashore there was a clamor for Skundu, and the whole population crowded his door, entreating and imploring in confused babble till he came forth and raised his hand. In that ye are my children I pardon freely, he said. But never again. For the last time thy foolishness goes unpunished. That which ye wish shall be granted, and it be already known to me. This night, when the moon has gone behind the world to look upon the mighty dead, let all the people gather in the blackness before the house of Hunia. Then shall the evildoer stand forth and take his merited reward. I have spoken. It shall be death. Bound vociferated, for that it hath brought worry upon us, and shame. So be it, Skundu replied, and shut his door. Now shall all be made clear and plain, and content rest upon us once again, Lala declaimed oracularly. Because of Skundu, the little man, Syme sneered. Because of the medicine of Skundu, the little man, Lala corrected. Children of foolishness, these thlinket people. Syme smote his thigh a resounding blow. It possesseth understanding that grown women and strong men should get down in the dirt to dream things and wonder tales. I am a traveled man, Lala answered. I have journeyed on the deep seas and seen signs and wonders, and I know that these things be so. I am La La. The Cheater. So called, but the far journeyer right named. I am not so great a traveler, Syme began. Then hold thy tongue, bound cut in, and they separated in anger. When the last silver moonlight had vanished beyond the world, Skundu came among the people huddled about the house of Hunia. 
He walked with a quick, alert step, and those who saw him in the light of Hunia's slush lamp noticed that he came empty-handed, without rattles, masks, or shaman's paraphernalia, save for a great sleepy raven carried under one arm. Is there wood gathered for a fire, so that all may see when the work be done, he demanded. Yeah, Bound answered. There be wood in plenty. Then let all listen, for my words be few. With me have I brought Jelches, the raven, diviner of mystery and seer of things. Him, in his blackness, shall I place under the big black pot of Hunia, in the blackest corner of her house. The slush lamp shall cease to burn, and all remain in outer darkness. It is very simple. One by one shall ye go into the house, lay hand upon the pot for the space of one long intake of the breath, and withdraw again. Doubtless Jelches will make outcry when the hand of the evildoer is nigh him. Or who knows but otherwise he may manifest his wisdom. Are you ready? We be ready, came the multivoiced response. Then will I call the name aloud, each in his turn and hers, till all are called. Thereat Lala was first chosen, and he passed in at once. Every ear strained, and through the silence they could hear his footsteps creaking across the rickety floor. But that was all. Jelches made no outcry, gave no sign. Bound was next chosen, for it well might be that a man should steal his own blankets with intent to cast shame upon his neighbors. Hunia followed, and other women and children, but without result. Sim. Skunduk called out. Sim, he repeated. But Sim did not stir. Art thou afraid of the dark? Lala, his own integrity being proved, demanded fiercely. Sim chuckled. I laugh at it all, for it is a great foolishness. Yet will I go in, not in belief in wonders, but in token that I am unafraid. And he passed in boldly, and came out still mocking. Some day shalt thou die with great suddenness, Lala whispered, righteously indignant. I doubt not, the scoffer answered airily. Few men of us die in our beds, what of the shamans and the deep sea? When half the villagers had safely undergone the ordeal, the excitement, because of its repression, was painfully intense. When two-thirds had gone through, a young woman, close on her first child bed, broke down and in nervous shrieks and laughter gave form to her terror. Finally the turn came for the last of all to go in, and nothing had happened. And Diya was the last of all. It must surely be he. Hunia let out a lament to the stars, while the rest drew back from the luckless lad. He was half dead from fright, and his legs gave under him so that he staggered on the threshold and nearly fell. Skundu shoved him inside and closed the door. A long time went by, during which could be heard only the boys weeping. Then, very slowly, came the creak of his steps to the far corner, a pause, and the creaking of his return. The door opened and he came forth. Nothing had happened, and he was the last. Let the fire be lighted, Skundu commanded. The bright flames rushed upward, revealing faces yet marked with vanishing fear, but also clouded with doubt. Surely the thing has failed, Hunia whispered hoarsely. Yeah, Bound answered complacently. Skundu groweth old, and we stand in need of a new shaman. Where now is the wisdom of Jelches? Syme snickered in Lala's ear. Lala brushed his brow in a puzzled manner and said nothing. Syme threw his chest out arrogantly and strutted up to the little shaman. Ho! Ho! As I said, nothing has come of it. So it would seem, so it would seem, Skundu answered meekly. And it would seem strange to those unskilled in the affairs of mystery. As thou? Syme queried audaciously. Mayhap even as I. Skundu spoke quite softly, his eyelids drooping, slowly drooping, down, down, till his eyes were all but hidden. So I am minded of another test. Let every man, woman, and child, now and at once, hold their hands well up above their heads. 
So unexpected was the order, and so imperatively was it given, that it was obeyed without question. Every hand was in the air. Let each look on the other's hands, and let all look, Skandu commanded, so that. But a noise of laughter, which was more of wrath, drowned his voice. All eyes had come to rest upon Syme. Every hand but his was black with soot, and his was guiltless of the smirch of Hunia's pot. A stone hurtled through the air and struck him on the cheek. It is a lie, he yelled. A lie. I know not of Hunia's blankets. A second stone gashed his brow, a third whistled past his head, the great blood cry went up, and everywhere were people groping on the ground for missiles. He staggered and half sank down. It was a joke. Only a joke, he shrieked. I but took them for a joke. Where hast thou hidden them? Skundu's shrill, sharp voice cut through the tumult like a knife. In the large skin bale in my house, the one slung by the ridgepole, came the answer. But it was a joke, I say, only. Skundu nodded his head, and the air went thick with flying stones. Syme's wife was crying silently, her head upon her knees, but his little boy, with shrieks and laughter, was flinging stones with the rest. Hunia came waddling back with the precious blankets. Skundu stopped her. We be poor people and have little, she whimpered. So be not hard upon us, O oh Skundu. The people ceased from the quivering stone pile they had builded, and looked on. Nay, it was never my way, good Hunia, Skundu made answer, reaching for the blankets. In token that I am not hard, these only shall I take. Am I not wise, my children, he demanded. Thou art indeed wise, O Skundu, they cried in one voice. And he went away into the darkness, the blankets around him, and Jelch's nodding sleepily under his arm.